All right. I'm excited today for the AI training. Um, I want to say a few things to you before we get going, which is um, the, the word AI is this term that's been used for everything. And, um, and I think what we've seen in the last week or so is uh, people starting to realize that there's a difference between different types of AI. So I don't know if you've had a chance to play with ChatGPT or some of the other technologies. And what ChatGPT and, um, and, and some of the other neural net technologies, everyone's starting to see, holy moly, these things are actually like somewhat omnipotent, um, except it's better, right? They're, they're not just omnipotent, they're omnipotent, but they're subservient to us. They work for us, which is awesome. But that's the difference between neural nets. And so today I'm gonna to walk you through this AI training class, but, but know it's designed to help people who are trying to understand what, are, what is all this stuff that people are talking about? Because you hear words like BI, ML, all this other stuff, and it is super confusing. But the reality is the type of AI that everyone's like going nuts over is this thing called deep learning. And it's just vastly different. And there's a reason why you're starting to see in the last year, all of these things going crazy. Like, why are they all doing these amazing things? Even though it's been this sort of rumbling for eight years, it's all sort of reaching this pinnacle. And I don't know if you've seen stability, uh, 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 stable diffusion, which is another one which can create photos from words and things wow. like that. Like there, or, or Dolly, which is the open AI version of it. Um, what about, there, have, you, have you seen Cactus AI? Have you seen that? I've yeah. seen that. I've, I, we, it, we can give it, all of these are all neural net types right. of AIs, which operate completely differently and have a totally different logic. And I'm going to do my best to explain it, um, but I'm going to start off with some basics, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. Can you see my screen? Yep. Got it. All right. I'm going to put you in slideshow mode. There we go. All right. So um, uh, I do this training for some of the most uh, powerful leaders in the world. You'd be surprised at how many people ask me to do this. I think it's why we're in the Wall Street Journal and and uh, and Wired and all these other great magazines is because at Collective Eye, we, we focus on some of the most advanced neural net AI and applying to problems. But, but everyone's always asking, please explain to me what's going on. And I know this is disruptive, so tell me what I'm missing. And that's probably the big thing I'm going to spend a little time on today. But I'm going to start with some pretty simple stuff and interrupt any time sure. throughout this presentation. So the first caveat I have to have is I am overly simplifying things intentionally for you and your audience. What that means is if you sit down at a dinner party and you talk about this stuff the way I'm about to teach you to talk about it, 99% of the time you are going to be correct. But if you had a, an expert who was sitting next to you, they would go, well, let me talk about this. That's not totally true. And I will tell you, don't worry about that. Because that person is dealing with such an esoteric aspect of this stuff that if you get caught in that esoteric aspect, the stuff's hard to understand. But 99% of the time, you're right, which is all that matters. If I explained to you how the internet worked to the 99th percentile, you would go, I never knew that, right? right. Uh, for example, people still say, I'm going to go to that website. That's not how the web works. I'm going to request from that website information sent back to my browser. <laughs> little detail, right? Sure. sure. It's a little bit more accurate. Does it matter? No. And in right. fact, I'm going to argue those little esoteric things that they're getting nitpicky on, they're the stuff that's going to confuse you and how this stuff works. You don't need, unless you're a practitioner, you don't need to worry about it if you're a user. Makes sense. All right. Uh, a little bit of background you know about us, um, uh, which is Collective Eye is focused on, you know, really enabling companies to predict, manage, and grow revenue. It's where we focus our time. We predominantly use neural nets to do this. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about each one of these things. So let's go fast. The world is absolutely transforming. Um, it is not minor. But when you think about data, you hear all these different terms. And oftentimes, people use them all interchangeably. And that can be super confusing. I am going to do my best in this call to unravel it. But I'm going to go fast through BI. AI and ML. And the reason is they're relatively useless for this discussion. But I'm going to explain it. So business intelligence, been around for a long time. This is sometimes called decision support. I'm going to argue that almost every one of the people that have a dot AI in their domain name is doing BI. I'm going to tell you that most people who talk about using machine learning is using BI. 
Why? Look, this is stuff that's designed to give you historical reports. You've seen this before in all your dashboards in Salesforce or Dynamics or HubSpot. These are our traditional reports that summarize data. And the challenge with summarized data is you lose all the interesting information in the average. If I told you it took me one minute to run uh, the race course and it took my mother 10 minutes to run the race course, what is the average? Five. Is it meaningful? No. Both were wrong. But that's right. essentially what these things are doing. Right. And there's a lot of really well-known players in the space, right? You, you probably know a lot of these players. You've seen them. These are really cool things to give you dashboards. It's meant to give you a sense of what's going on, but they tend to give you misleading information because of the summary. They look like this, right? Super cool, very pretty charts, but oftentimes they're dangerous charts. And, and you know that, right? It's almost always why you go into the details, right? As soon as you see this chart, what do you end up doing? You look at it in a spreadsheet format. And what are you looking for? The anomalies. Yeah, so you already know this. Yep. I don't need to tell anyone this. Yep. Yeah. And you're yep. clicking, you're drilling down into them to find the even more information on whatever. Yeah, because it. it's cool to look at. And basically, you're looking for something to change. And then you're going to the detail to figure out what changed. That's really how these things are used. But they have huge limitations. And can I give you a few examples? Yeah. Yep. Great. Um, one, they're summary data, which means it requires a deep analyst to do what you are doing, which is going into each of the little lines. In BI, they also talk about things in a really hard to do way. For example, there are sayings like 99% right is 100% wrong. So these BI projects are multi-million dollar projects. They require a data scientist and a data team to really go into every tool and to do something that's called extract, transform, and load, which is they're basically, imagine you have four different technologies. Well, those four technologies, let's just say, are all on different time zones. The ETL person has to go in and data item by data item, transform that into a standard, specific standard time, Greenwich mean time, whatever. They have to go in there and say, all these tools, we're gonna make the translation. If one is using uh, bookings and the other is using revenue, they have to make adjustments. They have to do this for each piece of data. It takes a long time to do this into a data warehouse. Those data warehouses have very large data dictionaries. They take years to build this stuff. It makes the organization very rigid. So if you've ever been in a company where they're using some really old tech and you're like, why don't we just use this new thing? That's because someone in the data side is like, no, 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 no. That would take us half a year to put in all the new data in all that way into the right fields. But that's where it's required when you have multiple tools sucking data in to provide it. That's that 99% right is 100% wrong. The data has to be clean. It has to be perfect. It has to flow all the right time. And the other piece that they'll always talk about is what's more important, real time or right time? You want to take a guess, Jay? Real time or right time? I'm going to say real time. They'll always tell you it's right time. For example... <laughs> If you're trying to figure out margin in the business, well, your expenses are front loaded, you know what those are, but the revenue hasn't come in until the, the last day of the quarter. So they can't tell you what margin is until the last day of the quarter. They would argue right time is always more valuable than real time because sometimes the reports you get back in real time are giving you an incorrect view, even though it's accurate to that moment. This is BI stuff. Super annoying, right? Like. Like details on details on details, but it gets worse. These three charts that you see here are an example of how even summarized data can lead to very wrong conclusions. Visualization is another piece of BI. Take a look at these three charts. They're all the exact same data. And That's they lead data. to completely different conclusions. The chart on the left, represents the chart that every news outlet uses to show the results of elections. And if you look at that, what do you think? Who won? Red <laughs> by a landslide, right? right? Yeah. The chart on the right represents population, popular vote. And what do you already learn about most of that red? There is nobody living in that part of the country. Right. So the first chart, which looked clear, when you look at popular vote, 
looks vastly different. All of a sudden you start to realize the most of the country is not where people live. Landmass is not an actual reflection of the popular vote. What you realize is almost everybody lives on the coast. Right. And there it's a lot more split, red and blue. But of course, that's not how our election system works. Our founders, for all their wisdom, said, no, we're going to have different electoral votes based on your population. And those votes are won by electorates. And all of a sudden, when you look at it in that light, the whole thing looks totally different again. So why do I bring this up? Because oftentimes people are like, get me this report quickly. And they're creating these reports using data. So anything wrong along this road, you end up with a wrong answer, which is why everybody uses these reports, ends up doing one thing inevitably, going into the details line by line with the ruler. That's BI. Any questions on BI? Yeah, very clear. AI. All right, there's a reason why everybody is out there going, oh my God, AI is about to change the world. But I need to be clear. We are going to cover a lot of different types of AI here and, and we're gonna cover them. But when, they, when, when Mark Cuban, when Satya Nadella, when everybody's talking about AI today, they are using it as a shorthand to say deep learning, not simple AI. In fact, machine learning has been around for 30 plus years and nobody gave anything about it. No one even gave a second thought. Have you heard people going, oh my God, machine learning 20 years ago, 15 years ago, they didn't care. Most of this stuff is gonna be so simple, you're gonna understand why it doesn't work. So there are two flavors of AI. And AI is just a term generally used for something that replicates human thought. So that's a broad category, right? In many ways, simple calculators are like a simple form of AI. But I wanted to break it down to the two that people are talking about most, machine learning and deep learning. There is an easy way to understand the core difference between machine learning and deep learning. In machine learning, you're gonna have a data scientist doing something called feature extraction. And in deep learning, there's no man in the middle. There's no person there. And this has big impacts. Let me explain why. Machine learning today is the most common form of AI that's out there. Predominantly because it's super cheap and you use it almost always when you have a little amount, a small amount of data. Deep learning, on the other hand, is this crazy new thing that people are excited about because the results of deep learning are so dramatically better, not just from other algorithms, but oftentimes from other people. It has exceeded what humans can do on their own. That's the jaw dropping moment you just had with chat GPT. You're like, write me a blog post on this thing. And it came back and you're like, that's pretty good. Machine learning, if you looked at it, you'd look and say, that makes no sense at all. Can I give a simple explanation for why they're so different? Yeah, please. The reason you have a data scientist or that man in the middle of machine learning is because you're using these very simple statistical techniques, things like regression, random forest, et cetera. Uh, uh, XG boost, and these are words that, that statisticians will know. What's happening is in machine learning, I need to narrow my data set down to a smaller number of features. And this is a feature is a term of art in data science. Think of it as a data element, male, female. That's a feature, okay? So if you think about it, there's lots of features in your world, they need to narrow it down to let's say 150, 200 features. So they bring in a data scientist who says, okay, I'm gonna try to figure out who should get a loan. Now I'm gonna think about what matters, income. I think that matters. How about um, uh, where they live? Zip code, all right, that matters. Maybe profession. So notice we're already up to three, how fast these number of features are getting short. So in essence, what's happening is from a whole bunch of features, this data scientist is trying to narrow it down with their skill. In essence, I want you to imagine this. You get a lot of data as a human being. You have two eyes, nose, taste, ears, touch, right? Imagine a data scientist coming in and be like, you don't need your right eye. For this problem, I don't think you need any ears. One nostril is plenty for you. That's essentially what's happening. They're limiting data down to smaller amounts. 
and they're trying to use it to make uh, judgments based on that small amount of data. Got it. Cool. Any questions so far? Well, just one, qu I guess the question there is when you're eliminating, to your point, like massive sets of data or any, or sets of data period, how is it that deep learning is making sense like that blog post? Uh, that's thing? machine learning, not deep learning. In fact, deep okay. learning is going to be the exact opposite. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. I can only work with small data sets. I have a human being in machine learning who's trying to narrow down data using their experience, using what they think is best. Got it. Deep learning takes the exact opposite view because there's no man in the middle. It's trying to get as much information as possible. And in fact, in deep learning, if I could add a, a eye on your head, in the back of your head, on e either side, the more data, the better it's going to be. For example, Tesla has a self-driving car. How many cameras does that car have? Does it have two in the front like a human being? No. Cars on the side, cars in the rear view mirror. Cars. It's looking all around the car. It's doing something that a human being is trying to do with mirrors. But it's doing it with eyes looking straight out. In fact, you could ask yourself, why doesn't Tesla have a camera looking up or down? In theory, it should, right? It's a self-driving car. Why would it benefit to have a camera looking up? Want to take a uh, guess? A tree might fall in the car. Bingo. Have you ever watched it where all of a sudden you see a car at their storm where the tree's on it? How great would it be if it was able to watch it and go, that limb does not look good. I'm going to move my car somewhere else. Could it right. save you a ton of money? Mm -hmm. For the cost of a little camera, yeah. Why would, you need, like... why would you need a camera below? Right. Pothole, uh, just, you know, something in the road, potholes, you know, whatever. Have you ever have you scraped the bottom of your car because you went over something that was too big, right? You mm -hmm. thought it was a ramp that was too big. Or how about this? After those same storms, you ever see cars flooded? Yeah. <laughs> if it sees the water's rising, maybe it's like, I'm going to drive it and I'm going to get away from this. Well, it sees the water is too deep and doesn't even go in it. Right? Yeah. Pauses you before you get to a place where it's too deep. Those are examples of where more data provides more learning. Deep learning is looking for massive data sets. Are you starting to see the difference between machine learning and, and it and, and deep yeah. learning? Sure. So why, why would you why? use deep, why would you ever not use deep learning, right? Right. Well, the question is, it requires a lot of data for it to learn. Deep learning with small amounts of data is usually worse than machine learning with small amounts of data. But if you can get large scale data, not only does it blow past machine learning, it blows past humanity. This is that moment you're seeing in all the deep learning tools that are coming out. And in fact, that's the theme I just want you to keep in your mind. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, that's quite a daunting uh, thought, but yeah, sure. So let's go through machine learning. We're gonna go fast on this one because honestly, it ain't that interesting. So why do people do it? What do they do? They, they look basically for a training set of data. They look and say, okay, let's say, um, uh, let's say I'm trying to figure out a spam, which is a good example. And I'm trying to figure out, I'm going to try to figure out all the things that someone lay, uh, tagged as spam. And I'm going to say, okay, what do they all have in common? And I'm going to try to use that training set data to find a pattern. Maybe it wasn't a real name. Maybe it was an email address that was reply at, you know, it's going to look for things like that to find it. Very simple stuff. When is it used? Almost always when you've got small sets of data. And I want to give you an example from sales. Think about the largest sales org you know. Let's say 40,000 people doing sales. That's actually a very small amount of data. It actually has two sets of problems. It's not only small in the sense of data, but it's also what's, what's called thin data. I may only sell this person once a year. I don't know that much about them. So what ends up happening in regression is I start narrowing down on things. So for those of you who've ever used things like uh, Salesforce, Einstein, or things like that, you've probably used machine learning. Most of my competitors use, uh, use machine learning, right? And you'll know that because they're only using your own company's data. And they'll probably use like two or three years of your company's historical data, which means you've got real problems, right? They're using two years of COVID to predict one year of World War III and inflation and all these other things, which is why people have never really used this stuff in sales. 
thin data, small data, changing all the time. New products come out, the whole data set blows up. A data scientist has to redo it all over again and try to make it work. So this stuff's been around for 30 years. Why don't people use it? It's only really good in simple areas. We use this sometimes, but for really stupid things. It's just cheap. So for example, if I'm trying to figure out uh, something simple like um, uh, when I, when should I send you the uh, you an email? I might use something like machine learning. Why? It's super easy. Doesn't really. There's not a high value to to that thing, um, and so I might find do something cheaper. Would I use it for forecasting? No freaking way. That's a like. Think about how hard it is for a human being who's got a real neural net in their head, right? Because remember, deep learning is mimicking our human mind. Machine learning is a statistical representation of a common theme, a common pattern. Deep learning is intelligent, like us. That's why when you do a chat GPT thing, you're like, wow, it understands me. You are you feel like you're talking to an equal. That's because it's actually thinking the way we are. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, it's awesome. But I mean, machine learning. Machine learning is always there. How do you know if it's machine learning? They're basically just using your own company's data. That's it. And you also know it because it gives you things like it will give you a recommendation for why it's suggesting something. Deal in stage too long. Right. Why? Because some data scientists thought stages mattered. Even though we all know for salespeople, stages go from one to five. <laughs> Nothing in between, right? right. They just skip them all. Um, it, the, the, the data scientists thought that was a good thing, right? And so they're using these very simple features. So when you get answers back there, so uh, when you get answers back, um, uh, you know that they don't sound right. You're like, oh, that, that deal's not going to have that high value. Oh, it's because you change stages quickly. I only did that because my manager told me to do it. Right, it's not real. Now, there's one thing about this that you'll also know. If you get an explanation for the AI, that's simple ML. This is gonna be the most counterintuitive thing you've ever heard. Stupid AI tells you how it makes decisions. And you know why it can tell you that? It covered up everything to a very small set of features. Right. So it's making very simplistic decisions on very small amounts of data. When you get to a neural net, we're talking about, like for example, in our forecast, a million features. Oh, yeah. It represents human. It represents humanity. Right. I'll, and I'll give you a good example. Um, if you could have a regular Kit Kat or a dark chocolate Kit Kat, what, which would you pick? Regular. Why? Uh, because it just tastes better. <laughs> dark chocolate's too uh, too bitter, I think, or something. I don't know. Okay, easy answer. Why can't you do that when it comes time to figure out if a deal's going to close? Because <laughs> I haven't. Well, I don't know. That's a good question. How many people are involved in that decision? Yeah. Do some of right. them like you, some of them not? Is the right. pricing different? You're no longer going from dark chocolate to milk chocolate. That was the only option I gave you. Right. Dark chocolate, milk chocolate can be done by machine learning. Right. However, once you start getting to human decisions, you are talking about a lot of complexity and it's not always for one simple reason they make the decision. Right. So when you're getting to complex things, that's where it starts changing. And notice that's why I have nothing more to talk about machine learning with you about. I have yep. officially ended. But here's the deal. Now that we're in deep learning, you might think, okay, here's where it gets easy. There are many different types of deep learning. And this is the last piece I really want you to learn. Think about the human brain. You have multiple parts of the brain, right? You have a visual cortex. It's the largest part of your brain. Why? Because your eyes represent a huge amount of data that you have to take in. In deep learning, there is a particular type of deep learning that is for visual and audio called the convolutional neural network. I'll cover that. But how about for text? There's a completely different type of neural net. And we have a different neural net in our head that deals with logic. We have a different neural net in our head that deals with spatial anomalies. We have all these different types of neural nets in our head that work together. Here, 
I want you to know that this deep learning is going to have multiple kinds. But before I do that, well, I, here's another quote, just to remind you. I don't know, this isn't a minor statement. I would agree with this statement, by the way. I think AI is the singular most important thing for all of humanity. I think beyond electricity and beyond the wheel. What is it used in? Today, it is basically formed the foundation of will be the next 50 years of innovation. From everything from self-driving cars, which people laughed at four or five years ago, to machine translation, deep fakes, facial recognition, collectivized forecasting, to robotics, everything that is mind boggling today is all relying on deep learning. How does deep learning work? It is designed to mimic our brain's neurons. It is not as advanced as our human neurons are very advanced. These are simple artificial neurons. How does it work? It takes data in and each one of those nodes has a piece of data. And they connect to other data. That's why it's called deep learning. You have different layers. The more layers, the deeper the knowledge is. Each one is looking at a piece of information and connecting to the others and it's creating a weighting for each piece of information. So how does it learn? I want you to think about a child that you've sat with. And when a cat walked by, the child turns and goes, doggy. And you go, no, cat. And they look at you, they look back at the dog or the cat and they go, doggy. And you go, no, cat. What are they doing? Well, what they're looking at is starting to say, what's the difference between the ears of a cat and a dog? Their eyes. I mean, they both have four legs, so it can't be that. Maybe the fur is different. Maybe the whiskers are different. Maybe the face is different. They're trying to figure out what features of the cats, when in combination, mean cat versus dog. And that's why you play the game with where you, where they point and go zebra, right? Have you played this game before where they're going through the, they're actually sure. looking and trying to spot stripes mean something different than horse. And they start putting it together to spot those things. That is exactly what deep learning is doing. Each time it's doing a trial and error and taking a piece of information saying, which one matters more? But there's so many features, it's got to look at them over and over again and figure out what's doing it. So how do you do that? Well, you need massive data and massive compute. It's a lot of trial and error to get there. What's actually happening? You don't really need to know this. I just like to explain it. Why? I feel like when you understand how it's working, it's not that hard to get. What it's doing is something called stochastic gradient descent. You don't need to learn linear algebra. It doesn't matter. Um, just know what it's doing is every time for each one of these nodes, it's saying it makes the prediction. If that prediction is right, it goes, great. I'm going to put more weight on that. And it's going to keep saying this, is more, this, this feature matters more and more until it gets to a place where it says this is a really important feature. But let's say it makes a prediction and that prediction is wrong. So I make a prediction, tomorrow you're gonna to win this deal. Tomorrow comes, you don't win the deal. I wonder why. Turns out it's Saturday. That feature is a, is a bigger feature. Back propagation comes back and says, this feature doesn't matter as much as the day of the week. Saturdays mean less likely to make the deal happen tomorrow. It just does trial and error, constantly do it. Now, why does this matter? Because this doesn't happen just once. In machine learning, a data scientist runs the algorithm once, it's done until they come back and run it again. This happens every day. This is why they call them learning algorithms. If it makes a prediction over the last 10 years, and one of the features is interest rates, and that interest rate hasn't had any bearing on the prediction value. But in the last year, all of a sudden, as that interest rate has gone up, all of a sudden it starts realizing that that thing is bigger, bigger waiting. It's gonna use that information and adjust the algorithm every single day. So that's a big deal because the world is constantly changing. There were probably companies three, day, three weeks ago that were selling to crypto firms thinking they had high odds of winning deals. And for those of you who are watching this, FTX blew up three weeks ago, which took down close to $30 billion of value. Well, a few days later, guess what's going to happen? Anything that's in the crypto sector, the AI is going to realize 
is having a change in attitude and it's going to automatically adjust those numbers and recognize immediately something has changed there. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, it's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Behind the scenes, this is always happening. Every single day, it's relearning information. And every single day, it's changing those weightings. And all these layers are constantly speaking to each other to say what's changing and what matters. So as I mentioned, though, there are multiple versions of deep learning. And I bring this up because this is another thing to be aware of. A lot of times when people are saying, oh, am I buying a tool with deep learning? They may be, but not that deep learning may not be used for the thing they care about. And I'll give you some examples. Here are some examples of different types of neural networks that are, are used. At Collectiveye, we use almost every single one of these. Natural language processing is the thing you saw with ChatGPT. The way it learned was it took the entire internet and digested language from there. And it learned patterns of things and it learned subjects that are going on. And it's essentially just repeating it back to you. When you ask it to do things, it's learned what you're asking. It learns what that probabilistically means and it's spitting it back out to you. That's NLP. So for anyone who's used conversational analytics, you've been using a product based on NLP. Who builds NLP businesses? So if someone says we use our, our own proprietary NLP, I will tell you that's probably full of crap. Because what do you need to make natural language processing work really well? Lots of data. Lots of data. Where's the most data in the world? The internet, Wikipedia, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, Reddit, all these places have lots of people talking about things. This is also why some of these NLP models have had trouble with being racist, right? It's learning things from the internet. And unfortunately, what does the internet have a lot of? <laughs> Horrible anti-Semitism and racist and, you know, you name it. And it just, it learns. It doesn't know it's good or bad. It's like a child growing up in a racist household. It doesn't think it's bad. It just thinks this is what mom and dad are. And that's what's happening here. It's learning from that. So a lot of these ultra large models have had to learn from anywhere else. And that's it. So when someone says, I have an NLP model that's, that we built, I promise you that's not it. OpenAI, which is created ChatGPT, said that it cost them $40 million to build their NLP model. And they give that away to other people to use. So we're all using somebody else's. That's a commodity in this world. Yep. Recurrent neural networks. That's another kind. Very important. These are used predominantly for time series. Take, for example, the odds of winning your opportunity. That's not a moment in time, right? I'm looking at a set of events. In fact, what do we all know? What do we say in sales? Time kills all deals. So time matters. Here you might use a recurrent neural network. So if I say I use NLP to do forecasting, but I don't use a recurrent neural network, I'm probably doing decision support. The sentiment of this email is bad. But have you ever been in a negotiation? When someone's trying to get a better price, are they saying, I love your product, it's the best product? Oh, no, they're saying, you know, your competitor says they do this better. The sentiment's going to pick it up. It won't know the difference between that's a negotiation tactic or that's just negative sentiment from an NLP model. And I'm trying to show you how these work together because I might use NLP to extract that information, but I might use a recurrent neural network to spot that it's actually in negotiation and that's why they're doing it. But that for this buyer is an example that they always do this to get a better deal, but it usually means they want to go with you. Yeah. So the sentiment can actually mean something else in a moment of time than the actual sentiment means. As a human with a real neural network, you know that. Right, You can tell when they're giving right. you a hard time, but they're going to go with you. They're just trying to get a better deal. So you know you give them a little something. Right. That's something you can only do if you use them in combination. Natural language processing creates more features that a recurrent neural network would use. Those features are based on language. See how they're starting to work together? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Like stacking on top of each other. Yeah. And they're all starting to work together. Convolutional neural networks. Well, we're on a video conference. If I start doing this in the call, <laughs> or I take you off of video, that means something. Convolutional neural networks are used to study video and speech. And in fact, we've seen some crazy claims that they can spot from body language what people are thinking. 
No one's ever proven it. The AI will find a pattern. But what if I'm doing this because I'm on mute and my girlfriend's yelling at me? The machine doesn't know it has anything to do with that. It's just taking it and reading it the wrong way. Generative adversarial networks. Well, this one's a cool one. Do you remember the movie War Games? Yep. Where Matthew Broderick, in the end, wins because he makes the Whopper play itself when it realizes yeah. there's no way to win the game? Yeah. That's a game. It actually has a game, and we're using these. Are, this is what's used for deep fakes. One machine tries to fool another AI, and then the AI at the end of it says, here's how you fooled me, and it improves it to try to again to fool you. And it does this back and forth. We do this a lot. For example, we have something called CI Recommends, where we try to figure out the optimal way to win a deal. We're essentially playing a game on what is the next best action you could do, but we're trying to game out scenarios of what's the best way to win this deal. A graph neural network, completely different thing. Relationships have impacts on sales. So we have something called connectors, which uses a graph neural network. It tries to understand not just how everyone's connected, but how does that actually lead to group decisions? And then you have reinforcement learning. This is actually where you, have you ever given a child um, a reward? Hey, if you get your homework done, you can have ice cream tonight. Yep. Welcome to reinforcement learning. I'll give you a reward for the faster you solve this game. Why do kids learn to cheat? Because that's the fastest way to get the reward. These are all different approaches, completely different ways of doing things, but they all can be used individually or together to solve different problems. And I say that because I think a lot of people claim that they're doing AI or deep learning, but maybe they're using it to say things like sentiment, but they're not actually using it for their forecast. Or that, and that's just important to know because if you're banking on a decision, you might want to know how these things work. You said you said at the beginning that your that collective eye uses almost all of them. All of them. Okay, so all not even all, all of them. All of them. Use. Yeah, all of them. Uh, when, when I say almost, for the most of the stuff you see, we're using almost everything that's in there. We may just be using it for a different part of the app that you. Oh, didn't got see. it. Yeah, got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So I'm going to bring this up. I'm going to go faster. Than this. How fast is this world changing? We are in 2022. So this is a four-year-old chart. Two years ago, or four years ago, this stuff was laughable. If someone said they were using NLP, you would say, you're kidding me, right? Because it was so bad, even a child would laugh at it. A year later, people were like, eh, maybe I can use it for pretty simple things. By 2020, People were starting to go, oh my God. Notice this was the rise of conversational analytics providers. Everybody uses these standard models because they're so expensive to create, but they're freely available. You can get, you can download Roberta for free. And each one of these was trained on more and more data. GPT-3, which is the foundation of chat GPT, was trained on 175 billion parameters at a cost of 40 million dollars. That's called an ultra large model. That not a lot of people can do. You have to have a massive amount of money. Microsoft gave OpenAI $1 billion worth of investment to do this. But it went from being laughable in four years to wow. That is happening in everything and it's starting to affect every part of our world. And these are just some examples. For anyone who's played with ChatGPT, you've realized that you can do things in that so quickly now. That's amazing. That's not the only thing. Same thing with Collective Eye. We track today, this is a little bit old. Today we track about 5% of the globe's B2B GDP. That's in line with how much Amazon tracks in B2C. Wow. Convolutional neural networks. This is what your car, self-driving cars are using. The big debate with Tesla was they were using cameras, not LIDAR. And the reason why is that cameras allow them to spot that it's a squirrel, not a ball bouncing. Because the way you might react is different for a squirrel, car, or child than a ball. LIDAR just sees an object rolling at you, All right? And that's an example, but you can see this is very, this has become used for video analysis, et cetera. There's tons of things here. Generative adversarial networks, I'm not gonna demonstrate this now, but this is what's happening deepfakes. It's essentially learning how to create or fool you 
by studying itself. It's actually playing a game, that war game against itself. This is a great one for reinforcement learning. This is most famous by DeepMind. DeepMind plays all these games and it learns how to play the games by trying to get a reward. And what this shows you is how fast it takes an AI that's using reinforcement learning to become better than a human. Now, this is a little bit old. This is from 2020. Today, there's no game left here that it's not winning in. Can I show you a short video quickly? Yeah, yeah, please. All right, let me pull it up. Give me one second. All right, I have to do two things at once here. I'm going to show you this very quickly. All right, let's pull it up. All right, I'm going to bring it up. Hold on one second. This is a demonstration that's old, but what's okay. nice about it is it shows how fast the DeepMind AI was able to learn. Hold on a second. Can you see my screen? Yep. Give it a second to load. It's gonna show you how fast it learned how to play the game Breakout. So the AI knew nothing about the game. The only thing it gets is a reward when it wins the game. I want you to see how fast an AI learns. See how bad it is with the paddle? Yeah. So the first 10 minutes it knows nothing about the thing, it's trying to learn how to play it. And you've probably seen children do this yeah, yeah. as well. So this is two hours of training. Okay. Within the first two hours, it's learned how to be at an expert level. Wow. But it, it doesn't stop there. It's amazing. Right? Wait till you see what happens next. At four hours of training it starts to learn how to beat the game. And the way it learns is it, if you notice on the left-hand side, it's trying to create yep. a hole. Yeah. So it, it learns how to use it to find that. <laughs> I bring that, I bring that up because that is a completely different way of operating. It's learning how to win the game through incentives in the same way that sometimes you might get upset if you say, I'll let you go to your holiday to get your homework done. And then you find out maybe your dishes still coming out dirty. Whoop. Sorry, one second. Maybe your detergent. Sorry, one second. <laughs> Sorry, one second. I should have shut that off. Sorry about that. Um, There we go. All right, I think you see my screen again. So yep. notice how each one of these AIs are doing something completely different. And they're all deep learning. In concept, they're all based off our brain. And I hope what I've taught you so far is that the way you think is the way these things think. Yep. So the cool part about this is that it's able to do things that are unbelievably powerful. The hard part is it doesn't tell you why. And do you know why? Today, you were married to a black box. I, I, my girlfriend is a black box. I don't know how she thinks. I know that she's got good choices and I know that she makes good decisions, but I sometimes don't understand why. And in fact, if I ask for that explanation, sometimes that creates more problems than I'd like to admit. Right. And the, the reality is, over time, you learn that these things are really good. When you use Waze, when you use Google search, you start to realize that these things are doing a better job because they actually have more information than we do, but they're very narrow in intelligence. And that's what makes these things so good, but it also means you learn to trust them. In the same way you learn to trust your friends with good judgment, and you also know sometimes 
some of your friends have bad judgment. That's the big difference between this technology. The shallow and machine learning or shallow learning that you get from machine learning will tell you why, but it's almost always wrong. Deep learning probably knows the subject matter better than any single human being, but it can't tell you why. It's also though the reason why this can be used in business. The deep learning black box aspect of it is what means people can contribute their data to get a greater learning. It means your information will never be shared. So it means whatever you think your secret sauce is, in the same way a driver, a taxi driver who thought he had a shortcut, it's not disclosing his secret. It's just adding it to the global knowledge to get everybody the best outcomes ever. And that's what makes this stuff so cool is it's really accelerating humanity by taking and making us all great. That breakout game yeah. is what's happening in for everybody in reinforcement learning. When you use this type of deep lear learning in your technology, we use it in sales, but what it does is it makes everybody have that breakout moment happen earlier. So we all get dramatically better. This is why they say it's bringing humanity to a completely new level. Everybody is better. It means, a first time manager has the ability to understand which deals are at risk in the way a 50 year veteran would have had. It helps you understand each individual customer's preference. So we all know the saying, buyers lie. Well, if someone says that that contract's on a CEO's desk, but the, let's say the collective eye odds say they're low, you know they say that to everybody, but the deal doesn't get done. They disappear. Right. It helps you learn without having to disclose any information. I think that's what's so cool about this. So there's tons of other stuff here to keep in mind. And there's plenty of risks around this stuff still. People talk about how it's unbelievably accurate, but no one knows why. Does it matter? I don't know, Google's extremely accurate. I don't know why. Right. It works for me, right? Yep. We do think about things like bias. We talked a little about how all these like uh, chatbots that were built off of the internet became racist. That wasn't great. So we have to learn how to deal with these things. And these are things that we've been dealing with now for about eight years. So what you're seeing is the data scale has gotten so big in each one of these areas. So a company called Stable Diffusion, if you haven't seen it, you can type in words and it creates a, a video. You want me to show you? Would that yeah, help? Yeah. yeah, I was literally about to write that down. Yeah. What's it I'll called? I'll show that? you right. Stable okay. Diffusion. Stable Diffusion. There's, there's, uh, OpenAI has their version called Dolly. There we go. I'll bring it up. I'll, I'll do a demonstration. Okay. All right. All right. Let's get started. So, uh, let's make something. You want to make something fun? Sure. How about we make a cat? Let's, oops. Sorry. One second. Come on. Why is my, there we go. How, why don't we do this? Why don't we make a cat that looks like a uh, lion? No, that's, uh, looks like a car. There we go. It's going to take my words and create images. This is using a convolutional neural network to do that work. Are you ready? What do you think a cat looks like a, 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 a cat that looks like a car? It's going to have wheels on it, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. Like the eyes are going to be like a windshield or something. We'll give it a moment. And we'll see what it does. It's going to be shiny. <laughs> <laughs> how about we do something different what would you like to see uh how make about, something crazy all right how about um a boy holding on to a rocket so each one of these is using a different kind of ai but they're all starting to get to the scale where they're doing these amazing things. Us in forecasting and deal odds and, you know, and recommendations of, of people, chat GPT and writing things from software code to eBooks, et cetera. 
stable diffusion in terms of creating images from words and, and making them happen without needing a, a, a graphic designer um, to do it. These are all things that are happening at this moment. And there you go. Sometimes they're random. Sometimes right. they're cool. Right. Yeah. Right? Was, That's was, not a bad one, right? Yeah. I had an image of a boy flying through the air on a rocket, but. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's, let's do that. <laughs> I, you know, I have, my mind goes to how does, how do we as business operators use deep learning or chat GPT to apply to something that we're doing every day, right? And so like, I'll just give you a quick example. I have a podcast, obviously you're on my podcast, right? I want to use this kind of technology chat GPT to summarize the episode for me, right? To write the summary. That's what this is. That's the, the, the we'll this do is it what seconds. that can do. It will do it in seconds. Right. Here we go. A boy riding on the back of a rocket. Wow. <laughs> so Weird one. I know. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. But you're starting to get the idea of things it does. And that's exactly yeah. what Chat GPT could do. And for right. for for your viewers, if you want, I'll let me pull Chat GPT up, and I'll I'll show you what that looks like. We can do sure. an example there. But each one of these is just using a different type of application mm -hmm. to solve different kinds of business problems. Right. We'll give it a second. There we go. All right. So let's say we want to. Um, oops, I have to log in. Sorry again. That's open source. Open AI is open source. Uh, open AI is not open source. It's actually now a for-profit company. It started off originally as an open source company. Got it. Um, and uh, and then it changed. So I just have to log in. All right. All right, you ready? So let's yep. say we want to write, um, help me. The cool part about ChatGPT is it's taking that ultra large language model and it's actually learning from what it's read and it's gonna create it. Wow. So it's giving me the outline. First, yep. it'll give me the outline. and But by the way, it has a concept now of understanding language. So when right. it's done with this version, We'll give it a second. Can you write it? And sure enough, it'll actually write it. So this is the cool aspect. And this is why jobs are changing. Because here you go. Here's a 500 word blog post. I like how it answers you first, but like it qualifies, it lets you know that it heard you and then it's going to do it. And then it confirms and says, I hope this is okay. And then it does it. That's amazing. And that's called AI theater, actually. That's not actually AI doing it. It's They've taught it to do that. Wow. Yeah. So that's a, the, that's a more of a theatrical to make uh -huh. you go, wow, they get me. But notice here's a 500 word. Not bad, right? I wonder why Microsoft fired all those journalists. Yeah, you can see how good it is. Now, I can keep doing things to it. And this is where this is where we're going to learn in business how to really make it great. So look at all the examples. It just keeps going and going and going. And, and so it will be it will be 500 words. That's incredible. Not bad, right? <laughs> just incredible. And on and on it goes. So Jay, I think I think that's the really cool part about all this. It's even going into considerations of data privacy, GDPR, yeah. right? Kind of like, yeah, what you were just talking about a little bit there in terms of uh, you know some of the challenges that you have to be aware of.
And what I, what I really like about this is this is what people are learning, which by the way is exactly how we learn to work with Google search, right? You're going to start right. to learn to do things like, I'm trying to do something to show the business side of it. So it's going to rewrite it with SEO, basically. I mean, and, and optimize it for, wow. <laughs> there you go. So what that what does this mean for content marketing? Probably it's dead. Yeah. Why? Because probably for the next 30 days, everyone's going to go start doing this. And what does it mean? <laughs> probably means you're going to start bombarding people even worse than before because now I don't even have to write it. Does that mean it doesn't have value? No. In fact, the big argument today is that for a product like this, it might replace Google. And I think right. that's the reason why I bring that up is because when you think about this applied to sales, the reason why this would replace Google is today in Google, I have to put in keywords. I then have to find websites. I have to read it. I have to distill the information. I have to format it. And then I might have to write something like this for my own blog post or for my manager for them to understand what's going on. Yeah. Whereas AI's already done all of that. So all I have to do is ask it to write it. And now I get a valuable thing that accomplishes the job I want. Take, for, for example, forecasting. Today, the way it works is a sales manager goes to the rep and says, I want you to do commits and best cases. And then they do an in, uh, inspection of those and they adjust it up or they down. And then it goes to the next manager who does the same thing. I have to review it. And it goes on and on and on. And we call it forecast Friday. It's an entire day loss of people trying to do this evaluation. Or an AI has read every communication or, or listened to every call and watched it. It's seen this buyer across multiple views before. And it just says, here's the answer. And that's actually the thing that's changing. If you're doing forecast meetings, it's the equivalent of going to Google and doing all that work or just typing in here what we did. We just rewrote a 500 word essay with SEO built in and we did none of that work. And we did that in the span of two minutes. Who is going to win the business? The person who does this, the person who does the forecast in the automated way, or the person who thinks there's some benefit to going doing the Google search, reading every one of those. Articles. That is a full day event that I just did in two minutes. In the same way, our forecasting did it in two minutes instead of a full day. These are, yeah, that's why it's so disruptive. Well, the, the second part of that is that it's, you're not cheating and you, you're not cheating the customer either. In other words, you're still bringing value uh, to them, but you're doing it, in, you're doing it faster, right? In other words, you're doing it, you're doing it and better. And much better, much higher consistency, higher quality. Remember, you read probably five of those websites. This right. read all of them. Right. <laughs> That's what makes it so much better. So this is why I said it brings humanity to a whole new level. It's just become a new tool that makes us even more. It's a new superpower that we're getting. And deep learning is so powerful, but it is important to understand that there's different kinds for different things because vendors will try to convince you in things and you need to know which ones are going to help you win. And I don't care which one you choose. I just want you to be intelligent about this stuff. And I want you to understand that you're trained to think like this, because how you would think of a problem is how it's thinking about a problem just with more data and just yeah. without emotional ties to it. There's no bias that I want this deal to happen. So in fact, I would argue, you'll always see when we roll this stuff out, when someone's like, I know for a fact I'm getting that deal. And yet we've got 33% odds on the deal. Our answer is always trust the odds, trust the AI. It knows more than you do. Call that customer up and say, hey, is there any reason this deal wouldn't happen? And more often than not, you're going to find out, well, I did hear that we have budget cuts. You're like, where did that come from? It helps you get past your biases. And that's really what's so cool about this is it's not meant to be perfect. Nothing's perfect. But boy, oh boy, is it going to get you working really effectively because nobody wants to lose their deal simply because they want it to be right. But does it become, but it does become more perfect every day though, given every day. Right, because the more information that it has, the better, the better, the closer to perfect it is becoming, right? And so but remember, but remember yeah. it's probabilistic. And I say that because 
it can't be perfect. Nothing in life is perfect. We're predicting. You can't be perfect when you're predicting future events. Right. Yeah. So today, it may say my odds are 33%. But today, my competitor might come in and say something like, F you, I'm going over your head. I'm going to get this deal done. And now my buyer's like, screw that person. That could happen today. And my odds could change by tomorrow. Right. So it's a moment of time, but it's telling you what's most likely to happen to this moment. And you're used to that, right? When you use Google Maps or Waze, it tells you here's the fastest route, but it's not surprising when it says an accident's happened, we're rerouting you. Right. You don't look and say the original estimated arrival was wrong. You say, wow, it's using up-to-date information to make sure that I get the optimal route with what's happening at the minute it's happening. That's what this AI is able to do. Yeah, and that's why with Collect Buy, you're opening that black box so you can actually see what you in process what you're not able, you weren't able to see in process before. And then I think that's when you know all of the sales training comes into place, right? Because now you know when you talk about right questions to ask and uncovering like all those things. Now that you know you can see around the corner, whatever it might be, and see into that black box. Now you, now it's time to ask that right question, right? As opposed yes. to before, you're just sort of asking it, sort of just because it's part of whatever your methodology is that you're asking. So, yeah. I, I think it's exactly, and that's where the skill comes in. Look, if you know where to focus your time, because a deal that you thought was going to happen has got low odds, you know what to do. Yeah. You get caught off guard when you're not paying attention because you think you got it in the bag. And that's what these stuff, that's why I said, this stuff is like superpowers. Um, it's that sixth sense where the hair on the back of your neck goes up. When the AI changes odds and it's not the way you think it should be, the hair on the back of your neck should go up because it's looking out for you. It just wants you to win every deal. Yeah, fantastic. It's like breakout. It wants to find the shortcut to help you to get there and win. And that's what this stuff does. So I hope this is a really cool overview and a way to make it. The hardest part I think is unlearning what you've learned about how technology works, which is if then statements. When you realize that this stuff is no longer rules based, but it's using the data to create the rules, that's when you get excited. Well, again, I think that people who listen to my podcast and are in my audience, if you're all of the things that everybody wants you to be, which is adaptable, have have a lot of curiosity, you're growth minded, you know, you taking a look at collective eye, but just all of the stuff that Stephen taught us today is, um, you know, to me, it's game changing. Like I can't, like I, my mind's blown. I can't wait to just start using all this stuff. You know, I mean, it's just, uh, there's so many applications, right. <laughs> to, to this. Um, and then, you know, obviously, uh, what we talked about before, um, on the podcast, um, where people, people will hear it if you haven't, um, I'll make sure I point to it, but, um, is just about, you know, how to actually, do apply this stuff in, in sales and your own overall sales uh, organizations. If you're an individual contributor or whatever to, um, to, to just make your life easier. Um, so this is this stuff, such a game changer, Jay, it, we're never going back. And here's the funny part is two years from now, we won't imagine a world where we could, didn't have this in every part of our lives. I mean, when you said, when you and I first talked, I don't know, a couple of months ago and you said ways for sales, like I got it on a certain level, but not on the level I have. Now, I mean, it just makes, it's amazing. It's absolutely incredible. It's absolutely amazing. This stuff's so cool. That's why I said we're really entering a land. This year alone, just to give you, put it in perspective, neural nets solve protein folding, which allows people to design drugs in a way they never dreamed. Last year, they said it would be impossible to predict how proteins would fold. Done. Given away by DeepMind for free. They said it would be impossible for a machine to drive its do self-driving cars. We're pretty much there. Like literally next few months, you're gonna see it, right? They said it's impossible to predict future outcomes. Collective Eye does it today. They said it's impossible for you to ask questions of a machine, get answers back, or to have it create images. These things are happening at that exponential pace. I promise you in two years, it will be the normal way you operate. And the people who don't are roadkill. It, that's well, you know, how big it is. Well, you know what that reminds me of a little bit? Did you ever see the movie um, Hidden Figures? Yeah. With, and they talk, you know, the I, big IBM machines came and they started, you know, helping them send uh, a space shuttle or rockets to the moon and all that. And they, you know, have, some of the women were, you know, sort of worried they were going to lose their jobs and they were against it and all that. And the other ones were like, you know what, I'm going to learn how to operate the machine, right? And that's this 
that's the point that you just made, right? In other yeah. words, it doesn't necessarily have to, like, I think you said this on the podcast, it's subservient to us if we know how to use it. And if we actually apply it and, and use it to our benefit, we can all grow and benefit from it. We don't have to run for, run and hide from it, right? That's what it is, right? So learn, these, learn it. Yeah. These technologies are omnipotent, but they are right. subservient to us. Right. So imagine what you have. You have the power of the entire internet. You have the power at Collectivite, you have the power of every seller at your fingertips helping you to win. It's literally like everybody, it's what we call collective eye, short for collective right. intelligence. You right. have the power of everybody trying to help you win your deal with this one particular buyer. They just, they're screaming, win, win, win. They literally are all behind you and you're helping them. And that's, that's right. what's so cool. And that's what's happening in the world. Chat GPT is learning from everybody. Think about the, what we're talking about. We're talking about the globe's intelligence being brought to you at a moment's notice, summarized for you. And then you're like, write this blog post, make it SEO and rich, do these things, do that. And now you're just working. You're like, great. Did Could you have done it? Yes. But now you could have done it in a minute. And that's the power. It's so crazy how good this stuff is. How can folks um, learn more about Collective Eye? Where should they go? If they go to www.collectiveI, the letter I.com, you'll learn tons of information. And I'm always happy, Jay, for you and your team to ever, if you ever want to do where that you can have all of them ask questions, I'd be, I'd be open to asking anything about deep learning, um, anything about why this is changing, how do I use it? I'll even happily do a chat GPT or stable diffusion demo with them where they can keep doing it for themselves and educate them. Jay, for you, I will do anything because you and your community matter a lot. Awesome. I really appreciate that, Stephen. For sure. Stephen Messer of Collective Eye. Go check it out. Thank you, everybody.